welcome to the last session on uh, transitional provision and procedure for registration and return. I request CA Ramdra S. Kore, Chairman of Sikasa Bangalore, to escort our speaker CA Hanish S. under the dais and present of Floral Book. by qualification. He provides specialized services in the areas of indirect taxation and is presently a part of the GST research committee constituted by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. He is also a visiting faculty at leading CA coaching centers in Bangalore. I now request CA Hanish S. to begin the session. Thanks a lot for the lovely introduction. <coughs> Good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm sure all of you look up to me with a lot of hope. Not in expectation that I'm going to be a good speaker, but in expectation that after my session, that is the end of today's session. Right? I'm sure that's the most awaited moment. <coughs> Last topic which we'll be discussing today is transition issues. Right? I could, we can relate to this as should we give some time for uh, others to settle down? One minute, let others settle down and then we start. Correct, no? That you are coming the right time. The reason is, 
you don't carry the baggage what I am carrying. <laughs> Even though I have recently qualified, it has been only 2008 when I qualified and practicing in indirect taxes, I still feel excise I have read so much, sales tax I have read so much, VAT I have read so much, how can I let go of so much? So whenever I read GST, I try to interpret whatever I have understood and say no, this is how it should be read. But for you, it is that much more simpler because I am not saying you have not read, but whatever you have read, you can easily erase and once again write something new on it. So whoever is experienced actually has a disadvantage over those who are starting this uh, entire journey in their indirect taxes for the first time. Because for me to accept that stock transfer is going to be liable to tax is still a surprise. But uh, sale of goods at sales, 1% to another, no GST sales. But there is no transfer property, no GST sales. There is no consideration but GST sales. Everywhere there is a problem, but still we have to accept the fact that stock transfer between one person to the same person in different states will be liable to GST. To accept that is really very very difficult, right? And with for from that perspective, you are at a better footing than me. Clear? Now let's start with transition issues. This transition issues is something like demonetization. Everybody has a view on GST, everybody has a view even on transition issues of how it has to be implemented. Look at this, I have got a thousand rupee note, government has said, what was the fateful day, November? 8th. On November 8th, right, government said whatever thousand rupee note you have is of no use, right. From the next day, I will give you a new two thousand rupee note. That is what is GST, date is different. Whatever taxes you were applying or whatever knowledge you were applying till the date, say assuming the GST comes on 1st of July 2017, whatever you had is waste. From 1st of July, you will have to talk to me in new terms. Earlier you were paying excise duty, you were talking about manufacture, you were talking about sale, you were talking about services. It is not relevant for me, it is like 1000 rupee note. But from 1st of July, what you have to transact with is 2000 rupee note or supply. Clear? But they gave some window saying whatever 1000 rupee note you have, I am going to accept it in railway stations, I am going to accept it in hospitals and in certain circumstances I am going to honor that. Transition issues is that provision which is going to honor something which is not at all relevant in GST. Example, if I have got a service tax credit, my input is service tax, I have got excess service tax credit as on 30th June 2017. First July output is GST. Input is service tax, output is GST. Can you set off a service tax against GST? You cannot. There are two different laws. Transition issue says, 1000 rupee note will be accepted in certain cases. If it is an eligible credit under GST, there are certain conditions which you have to fulfill, file the return, carry forward to GST, we will look into it in a lot more detail. Then I will allow you to carry forward the service tax credit into GST. So what we are talking about is not the 1000 rupee note. What we are talking about is not the 2000 rupee note. We are talking about when 2000 becomes valid, when will this 1000 rupees become valid? What are the circumstances when that 1000 will still hold good? That is what is meant by transition provisions. But before we get into the transition provisions, everybody, like I said, has a view on GST. Though I know you already know what is GST, I still want to tell you, according to me, what is GST. Clear? How will it work? I have a friend of mine, his name is A. All the teachers have some affection to A, B and C. My friend's names also are A, B and C. Right? Thankfully, when we were deciding our daughter's name, my wife decided what name should she get. Otherwise, I would have named her A or B or C. <laughs> right? So, I have a friend of mine, A, who is in Karnataka. Right? He has another friend, B. She is also in Karnataka. Right? Thankfully, this is an example we are giving after Valentine's Day. <laughs> the relationship between A and B was a business relationship. Right? He is not pinging her. 
he is sending some material to her, right? On which A has to pay tax, A is selling goods to B, both are in Karnataka. If A is a manufacturer, he will pay excise duty. If A is a trader, he has to pay VAT. Whether he is a manufacturer or a trader, anyways he has to pay VAT. Right? So A is going to sell goods to B because both of them are in the same state. Karnataka VAT law will apply and he has to charge VAT at whatever rate, 5.5% or 14.5% depending on what product he is selling. Right? Now assuming this transaction happens in GST, A and B are in the same state. A is going to charge tax. Excise duty is gone, VAT is gone. In lieu of excise duty, A has to charge a new tax called Central GST and A has to charge a new tax called State GST. Central GST to compensate the center for excise duty, State GST to compensate the state for the VAT. So he is going to charge CGST and because it is Karnataka, Karnataka GST. Every state will have a GST act, state GST which will be 29 states plus 2 other states, 2 other union territories which have got legislature. Now Ms. B, like it happens in our Valentine's Day also, Ms. B knows somebody. Who that somebody is? Mr. C. Mr. C is also in Karnataka. Right? And Ms. B is not pinging Mr. C. He, she is also selling the same metal which she procured from A to C. Right? And this example happened in GST. So even she is going to charge CGST and Karnataka GST. Is this correct? correct? Now B is going to take input credit of whatever A has charged and set it off against the liability on sale of goods to C and whatever is the balance only that she is going to pay in cash to the central government and Karnataka government. Example, if she has purchased the goods at 100 from A and sold it at 200 to C then on 100, 18% assuming is a GST rate has already been paid by her when she procured the goods from A. And when she sells, she has to pay a 36 rupees GST, 36 minus 18 which has already been paid, her value addition to the transaction is 100, to the government in cash she is going to pay only 18 rupees, 36 minus 18 rupees. Correct? Is our understanding correct? Okay. Now, government said the CGST and Karnataka GST is not sufficient, I have to add another monster. Right? So what they said, what would happen if you are in Karnataka, long distance call because of geo is very very easy now, right? So it does not hurt so much. So now Mr. A has his friend in Tamil Nadu, Miss B. I cannot expect A to get registered in each state where his customers are located. Correct? So he will charge CGST and Karnataka GST only because he is registered in Karnataka. I am sure some of you have already understood that there is some mistake in this slide. Please bear with me for a minute. Right? I cannot ask A to get registered in all the places where his customers are located because I might be in Karnataka. My customers are located in 29 states. I cannot get registered in all the 29 states. So what I will do? I am in Karnataka. I am registered under Karnataka GST. I will charge all my customers CGST and Karnataka GST. Next. Now Miss B is in Tamil Nadu and his her customer is also in Tamil Nadu. What is she going to charge? CGST and Tamil Nadu GST. Correct? Because both of them are in the local state. Now look at this scenario. CGST can be set off against CGST. Output CGST between BC can be set off against input CGST of AB. But output CGST, output Tamil Nadu GST cannot be set off against input KGST. Look at this problem, right? If it, everything was local, I would get the credit. If it is not local, if one of the transactions is local, not local, the credit chain will stop, correct? And if this model would have been accepted, today we have fights over water. <laughs> Tomorrow we will have fights over credits. Because GST is a destination based consumption tax. Entire tax on this transaction along with the goods should move to Tamil Nadu. But here it is getting stuck in Karnataka because once the tax in Karnataka has been paid, you cannot take, utilize that credit against the Tamil Nadu output. Better sense prevailed and they said we don't want this model. Whenever the customer, I am making it very simple but we have to read 
the place of supply rules, which is there in the IGST rules, it says whenever a customer is outside the state, don't charge local taxes. Charge IGST. And IGST will be with the central government. It is not the revenue of the central government. It will be with the central government. A will charge B, IGST which will be 18%. When B sells the goods to C, CGST minus IGST, she will pay the tax. Tamil Nadu GST minus IGST, she will pay the balance tax. So IGST will be like a credit mechanism for interstate transactions. Which will avoid all this confusion of which state gets what revenue. Now, how IGST will get distributed, let's not get into politics behind it. There are a lot of champions who are already fighting in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha on RBR. Let them do their work, we will do our work. Clear? This is how the model of GST will work. If it is a local transaction, CGST, HGST. If it is an interstate transaction, it will be IGST. IGST can be set up against, I am sure just the last session you would have understood. IGST can be set up against IGST, CGST, SGST. CGST can be set up against CGST, IGST. SGST can be set up against SGST, IGST. CGST cannot be set up against SGST, SGST cannot be set up against CGST. Very, very simple. Correct. Now, we will move ahead to another simple topic. From here we start with migration of GST. My, sorry, transition provisions related to GST. I am holding a registration certificate under service tax today, under VAT today, under excise today. What will happen to me? There are different models of registration. If you look at the excise model, each factory is a separate unit. I have one factory on the left hand side of uh, Kanakpura and I have another factory on the right hand side of Kanakpura. The difference between the two is only the road. Right? Still I have to take two registrations under excise because both are treated as separate units only recently from 1944 every factory is a single unit only last to last year's budget they said if you are falling under the same jurisdiction and if you have common process for manufacturing a common product you can take a centralized registration under excise also but there also Kodumang, sorry, Kanakpura left hand side is different jurisdiction, right hand side is different jurisdiction. <laughs> Correct, so that provision also is of no use. Under excise, each factory has got a separate registration. Under VAT, how many number of units you have in Karnataka, you have to nominate one place as principal place of business, everything else is a branch. So, if you look at an example, manufacturer has got five different places in Karnataka. He has to take five different registrations under excise. But when it comes to VAT, he has to take only one VAT registration. All the other four premises, apart from the principal place of business, will be treated as a branch of the entity. Come to service tax, forget the state. I have got ten different states where I have registered. I can still take one registration, centralized service tax registration. And I have to file only returns twice in a year. Clear? As simple as that. So we have three models under excise, each unit, under VAT, each state, under service tax, country. Only one registration is sufficient. It is at your option, you can take centralized registration. Now, GST has adopted the VAT model. That means you don't have to take registration of each factory. But you do not get the advantage of a single registration also. Now if a manufacturer had 5 locations for manufacturing, he had to take 5 registrations, he had to file 5 returns and there were 5 assessments. So here I will have only 1 registration, 1 assessment. Advantage for manufacturers. But when it comes to service providers, take a case of cafe coffee day. They are there in every nook and corner of Karnataka and India. Vaishnav Delhi also you will find on coffee table. Correct? So assuming they have centralized registration. For the entire India operations, they are filing only two returns and only one assessment. But under GST, if they have operations in 29 states, under GST, they will have to get registration in 29 states. They have to file re returns for all the 29 states and assessment will happen for all the 29 states. Clear? For some assessments there is a gain, for some assessments there is a loss. Clear? But what happens, that is under GST, what happens to my existing registration? 
I am sure all of you would have uploaded a lot of documents between 1st of January to 15th of January. Correct, no? You are already champions of enrollment and migration in GST. But just one thought, right? Do we have a GST Act? It is only a model law. Correct? It is a model law which has not got approval of Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha and it has not been signed by the President. It is like a piece of paper or huge bunch of papers, right? It does not, it is as of now not legal and there are views which are possible which says that whatever you have done is illegal. Government is only trying to be prepared that uh, like IRCTC everybody does not, when Tatkal booking opens, everybody does not go and get the GST number at the same time and the server will crash. It wanted to avoid that kind of a scenario, they said uh, we will give blocks Based on that blocks you go, get yourself migrated, get the GST number, it is a 15 digit number. But actually what does the law say? Law is very simple. It says, whoever is registered under the present law, everybody, I will give you a provisional registration. If you are registered under excise, service tax, VAT, you are registered under PT, sorry not PT is not uh, getting uh, subsumed, entry tax, luxury tax, wherever you are registered, I will give you a provisional registration. And I will give you time to file the documents to prove that whatever information is available is correct. I will give you time of 6 months which can be extended. If you file within 6 months time, your provisional registration will become final registration. Clear? If you file all the documents within 6 months time, whatever was a provisional will become final. The number will not change but the registration status will become final. But if you do not file the documents within 6 months time, then automatically your provisional registration will get cancelled. Clear? Now, if we look at this method, there is a problem in this method. My turnover under service tax is 11 lakh. Am I required to pay service tax? Because it is beyond 10 lakh rupees, I am required to pay tax. What is the threshold limit under GST? There is no exemption as of now, but we will loosely use the word threshold limit. What is the threshold limit under GST? It is 20 lakhs. If my turnover continues to be 11 lakh, am I required to take the registration under GST? But they are saying whether you want or not, I will give you registration. For that they have said, I will give you the registration. But after I have given you a provisional registration, you let me know whether you want to continue that registration or not. If you don't want to continue the registration, then you ask for it, I will cancel the registration whatever I have given you because your threshold limit is below 20 lakh rupees. Or second, my turnover today is 25 lakh and I am paying tax under VAT at the rate of 14.5%. Under GST I want to go under composition scheme. From 20 lakhs to 50 lakhs under GST I can go under composition scheme and as a manufacturer I can pay tax at the rate of 5%. As a trader I can pay tax at the rate of 2%. Can I do that? But I was under regular scheme today. GST is going to give me a regular registration. What do I do? I want to convert to composition. I can file application and convert my regular registration into composition registration under GST. And that will happen only after the GST becomes live. Is this clear? Very simple. First, do you want, do you want to continue the registration? Yes. File the documents within 6 months. If you file, your registration becomes permanent. Otherwise, it will get cancelled. If you want, if you don't want to continue your registration, then you can also file a letter, or uh, online form is there, through which your registration will get cancelled. Or second, you, if you want to convert your regular registration to composition, also apply with the government, they will convert your regular registration under GST to composition and you will be able to pay the tax at a concessional rate. Clear? Can we move ahead? What happens to my 1000 rupee note? carry forward of trades. What do I do with that? If you go to the GST Act, there are a lot of GST laws, sorry. There are a lot of provisions dealing with credit. I have collated all those and put it in one slide so that it is easy for us to understand. Right? If you have shown that credit in your returns, so when do we file the service tax return? 25th of April, we are going to file the returns for October to March. Right? 
we are, when are we going to file the VAT returns? On 20th of April, we are going to file the returns for March 2017. When are we going to file the excise returns? By 10th of April, we are going to file the last excise return for March, assuming GST would have come on 1st of April. So, assuming the GST comes on 1st of April, my first return which I am required to file will be 10th of May, 15th of May, and 20th of May. We will discuss about what are the returns I am going to file but as of now suffice to say that the first return what I am going to file in GST is 10th of May. Before that I have already filed the return in the existing provisions. Correct? GST comes on 1st April but for certain period the old law will still continue. I have filed my transactions and, my, and I have reported my transactions in the old return in ST3 ER1 VAT 100 whatever is the form. Now whatever is the credit you have disclosed in that return, you will be able to carry forward that credit into GST. If you have an excess credit under the central taxes, it will become a CGST credit. If you have excess credit under the VAT loss, it will become a SGST credit. Nobody will have a IGST credit on the first day. <laughs> is this clear? Because it is a new tax. Central is getting subsumed to CGST, state is getting subsumed to SGST. Right? So whatever credit you have shown in your return, on 25th April you have filed the return for service tax ST3 showing unutilized credit, the closing balance of credit 5 lakh. You will be able to carry forward that credit into GST. Is this clear? Whatever is the closing balance here will become an opening balance under GST. Now, under SGST, they have given 3 months time. Under the central law, they have not given 3 months time. Whatever return you have filed, the last return what you have filed under the current regime, whatever credit you have shown there, that will get carried forward to the GST. But in case of state GST, they have given you 3 months time. We will come to the reason behind that, but as of now just remember that 3 months has been given. The issue here is, if GST does not come by 1st of April and assuming it comes on 1st of July, then what is the last date, last return I would have filed under service tax? March, which I filed on April. But 3 months I would have accumulated the credit. I have to report the transactions of 3 months under service tax because I will be paying service tax on that. Maybe if you remember from 1st April 2012 to 30th September 2012 that split the return period to 1st April to 30th June and 1st July to 30th September 2012 if you are aware of it. Right? Likewise here also this half yearly return of service tax will have to be split. As of now there are no notifications but once the date is announced I am sure the return is going to be split. If say they are talking about 1st July of GST implementation, we will have to file a return under service tax for April to June and whatever credit I have shown in July by filing the return on 25th of July, if assuming that is a due date, I will be able to carry forward into my GST return whenever I file the return. Is this clear? Now, they come up with a very interesting provision on pending statutory forms. What are these pending statutory forms under the state law? I can get, I can sell the goods at 2% if my customer says I am going to issue a form C. At the time of assessment, if my customer has not given me the form C, I will have to pay the differential tax. Assuming the goods what I am selling is liable tax at the rate of 14.5%, when I am selling the goods, I will charge only 2%. But if the customer defaults in giving me form C, then I will have to pay the differential 12.5, 2% I have already paid. Now, and this form C and all the statutory forms, statutorily are required to be issued within 3 months time from the end of the quarter. Statutorily, nobody follows it, but statutorily I am required to receive those within 3 months time. The GST law says, if you have any transactions which are covered by the statutory forms, but you have not received those forms, form C, form F, E1, E2, form H. If you have not received those forms, what is your liability on that forms? To that extent, I will not allow you to transfer the credit from your VAT to the GST. Which has a very big impact because if I have got huge excess credit, I will not be able to utilize it because my customers for sure would not have given the form C to me within 3 months time. Now that is why states have been given 3 months time extra. 
you decide how much credit you want to transfer. Wait for three months because statutory forms have to come within three months time. Wait for three months. See who are which are customers of yours are giving you statutory forms. If you are not getting the statutory forms within three months time, to the extent of the credit available, let's let's take an example to put things into better perspective. Assuming I have got an excess credit of ten lakhs as on thirtieth of June two thousand sixteen. And in the entire year, I have made a turnover of five lakh rupees against my form C sales. On that five lakh rupees, I have already paid two percent tax. Assuming I have to pay balance twelve point five percent tax for simplicity sake, we are saying we will take ten percent, right? On five lakh rupees, I have to pay still fifty thousand rupees tax if form C does not come. Government says this provision, transition provision says, if a credit is ten lakh, restrict fifty thousand. Only nine lakh fifty thousand you will be able to transfer it to your GST. Is this clear? So out of ten lakh fifty thousand will be restricted. Nine point five lakhs will be allowed to take credit off under GST. What happens is fifty thousand. Whenever you get the form, you apply for refund. It is see when you have not been allowed to take the credit. That means government has already got that money, right? Fifty thousand is with the government. Whenever you get the form. After six months, you get nine months, you get ten months, you get. You give it to the department, and department is going to give refund of that fifty thousand rupees. And I am sure all of us know how easy it is to get refund. <laughs> right now, but there is one technical problem here. They have, if you look at the law, meaning if you look at the bare section, they use the word section three, section uh, five, section six, and six a. Form C co comes under section eight. It does not come under section three. I am sure it is only a drafting error which will get rectified. So as of now, if the same provision continues, form C will not be a problem. Form F, E1, E2, and form H will be a problem. But I am sure that three will get replaced with eight, right? So even form C will become a problem. Clear? Next, credits in transit. They have used the word goods and services in transit. Goods can be in transit. Services cannot be in transit. I cannot say. You did not call me, sir. I was calling you. The call is stuck in Silbo traffic. <laughs> Either I have called or not called. It is a telecommunication service, right? So, but they loosely use the word services in transit. We will accept that. Now, what happens to services in transit? That is, the invoice has been raised on 30th of June. The goods have also been dispatched on 30th June. From say, my customer, my vendor is in Maharashtra. He has already issued the invoice also. Right, and he has dispatched the goods also on 30th of June. I received those goods on 5th of July. I cannot take the credit of excise duty charged by him because excise duty credit can be availed only when I receive the goods. I have received the goods when excise duty is not applicable at all. It is GST. What do I do with that credit? They say I will give you 30 days time. If the invoice was raised before GST. And you have accounted for that invoice within 30 days of implementation of GST. I will give you credit of that. But after 30 days, if you ask me, I am not going to give you credit. Is this clear? So I will repeat again. If the GST is implemented, sorry, when the GST is implemented, I will get 30 days time. Whatever credits I have not reported in my returns, I will be able to take credit of that in GST because whatever I have availed in the returns. I will carry it forward. Whatever I have not done in the returns, I get 30 days grace. I will be able to account for those credits under GST. Is this clear? <clears throat> Then service tax gives me time to file revised return within 90 days of filing the original return. VAT gives me time of six months to revise the original return. Correct. Excise gives me time only of 20 days. By the end of the month, I have to revise the return. Right. Now, when I was filing the service tax return, I got a credit of one lakh rupees. I filed the return. After that, within those 90 days, I got to know that somebody has raised the invoice which I had not accounted, and that one lakh actually became five lakh. I revised the return by increasing the credit from one lakh to five lakh rupees. What happens to that? You will be surprised to know under GST there is no concept called revised return. So whatever return I have filed by showing one lakh credit, you know somebody is looking surprised. 
imagine my fate. I have been revising the returns. All the chartered, chartered accountants are finalizing the service tax returns only when they revise the return. First day nobody has the data. They will file some return and then after 90 days only the correct data comes. Right? So imagine how surprised I will be. No revised return only in GST. Every day I have to finalize the return and then file it. Right? So now coming to GST. Because the original GST return will not be allowed to be revised, I cannot change that 1 lakh to 5 lakh. Because that, that return is gone. I have claimed 1 lakh, 1 lakh is accepted. What do I do for that 4 lakh rupees which has come to me after 30 days? Because if it is within 30 days, second clause already covers. What if it is after 30 days and I am including it in the revised return? We will have to file for a cash refund. I am sure all of us know. How easy it is to get refund. Correct? So I will have to claim cash refund of that. Fourth, what if I have not disclosed the, the credit? Because today I get the credit within one year from the date of invoice. So if I get the invoice on 30th June 2017, I can take the credit by 29th June 2018. I have not taken in the original return also. I have not taken in the revised return also after 90 days. I thought I will take it in the next year. Next year GST came. What happens to that credit? I will lose that credit. It is in our interest to advise the clients that ensure that all the vendors raise the invoice before the GST gets implemented or 30 days grace period. If I do not get your invoice within 30 days, then either raise an invoice in GST or raise an invoice forget the tax, I am not going to pay you the tax because the tax is a cost for me. I would have availed that if you would have given it to me within time. If you have not given within time, I am losing that credit. I am not going to pay you the tax. One is vendor invoice will have to be up to date. Second, my records will also have to be up to date so that I can claim that credit under GST. Is this clear? We are talking about four scenarios. Availed in original return, carry forward in GST. Not available in the original return, 30 days time period is available. Revised return, cash refund. Not shown in the original return and in the revised return, forget it. As simple as that. All the four scenarios covered. Any other scenario which you can think of? No? Unavailed credits. We were talking about credits which have not been availed at all. They have given some special circumstances where those unavailed credits which are not captured in the return, I will get credit of that also. What I am discussing here, carry forward of credit, are only those credits which are captured in the return. What if there are certain credits which are not captured in the return, right? Capital goods. When do I get the credit? 50% in the first year, balance in the next year. In case of bank, I cannot claim the credit on capital goods till commercial production starts. Till my commercial factory commercial production starts, I cannot take credit on the capital goods. What happens to those credits? I wanted to start my factory on 1st November. So I have not taken credit of capital goods because all the capital goods got installed by 31st March but production is starting only on 1st of November. I have not taken the credit. Second, under excise, I bought some material machinery in 1617. I will take 50% credit in 1617. 1718 I have to take the balance credit if I have not taken. Now the issue is that if I have already taken 1st of July, if GST is getting implemented 1st of July, you would have always claimed on 1st of April. Assuming I purchased some material or machinery on 1st April 2017, 50% on 1st April, balance 50%. Next year, there are those kind of credits, the transition provision says, whatever you have availed, carry forward. It's there, you have already captured in the return, carry forward. Whatever you have not availed, which is availed minus unavailed, whatever you are supposed to avail, you are supposed to take 100 rupees credit, you have taken 50 rupees credit because 50 percent in last year, balance, though it is not in the return, you will be able to avail the credit in the first return of GST. Clear? Very simple provision. You are entitled to 100 but the provision said take 50 in this year, take 50 in the next year, 100 you are supposed to, where you are supposed to take, 50 you have already taken, balance 50 you can take in the GST. Under the VAT, I was supposed to take 100, but because the commercial production did not start, I have not taken any credit at all. 100 minus 0, entire 100 I will be able to take under the GST. Is this clear? Boring? Trust me, if you are able to, if you are required to implement GST, 
transition provisions are the most important provisions because after that everything you will get the credit you don't have to teach your client that you do the accounting like this you will get the credit you file the return like this you will get the credit he already knows better than us but what he does not know is if I have not claimed the credit in the original return I will lose the credit if I don't get the forms from my customer I will have to retain the credit that we will have to inform so GST is one part but this transition provision I am sure all of us know demonetization everybody knew what to do with 2000 everybody knew no value of 1000 but whoever knew how to had the upper hand correct no? Credits on inputs held in stock. Right? I have got certain inputs which are held in stock, but on that I have not claimed the credit. Right? For some reason, I was under SSI limit of 1.5 CR. I have got inputs. I have not taken credit. This might look very theoretical. I'll give you an example. I procured certain inputs. Right? I am manufacturing goods, and my turnover is 1.5 crores. I am not required to pay excise duty. But under GST, the turnover limit is only 20 lakhs. I will have to pay excise duty from the first rupee because last year turnover is more than 20 lakh rupees. Right? Now, I have purchased one material. Assuming GST gets implemented on 1st April 2017. I purchased some material on 28th March 2017. It will be used for the purpose of manufacture of exempt goods. I cannot take the credit of the SNY credit rules. Correct? But I manufactured it or the raw material is still lying with me I am going to manufacture it in GST and pay GST tax on that input I will not be allowed to take credit but output I have to pay tax under GST don't you think my cost of production will be very high 100 rupees is the value of raw material you have purchased on that excess you have 10 rupees you have paid assuming your procurement cost becomes 110 because on 10 rupees you are not getting input credit is my reading correct? Now the same material if I purchase on 1st April 2017 100 rupees plus 18 rupees GST which I can take credit of So instead of buying in the last end of March I will plan that all my procurements will happen in April So whoever purchased in March will have a back foot because whatever taxes they have paid they do not get credit of it Correct? To avoid that kind of a scenario the government said I know you have purchased certain goods on which you are going to pay, pay tax under GST if you have purchased under GST sold under GST you will get the credit if you have purchased under the earlier law but you are paying tax under GST as a benefit I am going to give you credit but you have to satisfy certain conditions what are those conditions? first you were not required to be registered under the earlier law only then you will get the benefit or you were involved in manufacture of exempt goods or rendering of exempt services just because some closing stock is there and you have not availed the credit I am not going to give you benefit you have to be either a manufacturer of exempt goods or rendering exempt service or you should be a works contractor paying taxes under abatement scheme notification 26 of 2012 or you should be a first stage dealer, second stage dealer or an importer today a first stage dealer, second stage dealer or an importer cannot charge tax they can pass on the credit correct? if you are all of these then if you are using those inputs for taxable purposes that means you are going to pay tax under GST only then I will give you credit if you are not going to pay tax under GST I am not going to give you credit correct? second you are in possession of a semi document that means you have a document which says how much excise duty was paid on the input which you have in stock and third that stock should not be one old than more than one year that is if GST gets implemented on 1st April 2017 the stock should not have been purchased before 1st April 2016 it should be within one year's time fourth you have to pass on the benefit whatever excise duty you have taken that benefit you have to pass on to the customer I will take this pass on to the customer a little later and you should not have claimed any abatement under GST that gives us a hint that there will be abatement under GST they say you should not have taken abatement under GST that means there will be abatement under GST right? <laughs> next 
if you are dealing in taxable and exempt, taxable go to the last slide. You have already taken the credit. Exempt you come here. You bifurcate your credits into taxable and exempt and then take the credit. Right? We will, I'm sure uh, not many people have understood including me or uh, whatever we are trying to say. Correct? No? Somebody is saying yes. Sir. Now, whatever credits have not been disclosed in the returns, I will get the credit of it provided I satisfy all these conditions. A very very important section. Take an example. I am an importer. I am not a manufacturer. I am an importer. I pay basic customs duty at the rate of 10% on import of goods. Very good. I pay additional customs duty at the rate of 12.5% on import of goods. I pay SID at the rate of 4% on import of goods. Effectively, the tax rate comes to close to 30%. If I imported goods worth 100 rupees, on that 30% I have to pay customs duty. Correct? SID I can claim a refund. Very difficult to get. Sorry, very easy to get. Right? I'm sure all of us know. Right? So, assuming 4 rupees is gone. Out of 30, 26 rupees is my cost. So, 100 rupees is the value of goods I have purchased. On that I have to pay a custom duty of 26 rupees. My costing is 126 rupees. Assuming I want to earn a profit of 10 rupees on this. I will add the 10 rupees. What is my selling price? 136. On that I am going to charge back and sell it to my customer. Correct? Now look at the GST scenario. 100 rupees. I will pay basic custom duty of 10%. There is no additional custom duty, no SAD. I have to pay IGST, 18%, which will be available to me as credit. So what is my cost then? 100 plus 10 plus 18. 18 I will get credit, so it is an asset. It is not my procurement cost. So my cost is 110. On that I will add a margin of 10 rupees. The cost becomes 120 rupees. In our earlier example, what was the cost? Selling price? So, the government says, if today you are not able to take the excise duty credit, your price was 136, I will give you the benefit of excise duty, that is additional custom duty, I will give you credit. But that credit, you will have to pass on to the customer. That means whatever credit I take under this, credits held in stock, to that extent, I will have to reduce my selling price. And if I don't reduce the selling price, an uh, authority will be formed to check whether what prices at which I have sold the goods is correct or not. And if it is found that it is wrong, I have not passed on the benefit, then penalty will be levied on me. This is called anti-profiteering provision. This is borrowed from Malaysia. In Malaysia also when GST was implemented, same thing was done because whatever was not eligible as a credit. See, if I am a trader, I am not eligible to exit the credit. Whatever I was not eligible as a credit, I am getting that credit. For that government says it is not your profit. Because if I don't change my selling price, my selling price remains at 136, I am getting credit of 12.5. My profit instead of 10 will become 22.5. Government is saying prices will reduce in GST. How will it reduce? They will say 136 rupees plus yesterday I was charging you 14.5% back, today I will charge you 18% GST. All the price will increase. How will it reduce? Because of this provision. Wherever you were not getting the credit, I am giving you credit provided you pass on the benefit to the customer. If you pass on the credit, only then you get the credit. If you don't pass on the credit, you will not get the benefit. Is this clear? <coughs> Little overdose, no? Generally in my class, there is not so much of silence. Right? Next, composition dealers. What do you mean by composition dealers? The government has defined what is composition dealers. If you are required to pay tax at fixed rate or fixed amount, that is called composition dealer. Assuming, sorry, example, under works contract for VAT loss, you have to pay tax at the rate of 4% irrespective of turnover. Composition. In case of excise, depending on the machinery, you have 5 machineries, per machinery 50,000 rupees, 50,000 multiplied by 5, 2 lakh 50,000 rupees, lot of time. <laughs> so much of time that we can finish up the GST law again and revise what has been done from morning. Right? Okay. So those are called composition scheme. Under composition scheme, because I am paying tax at a concessional rate, I do not get the credit. 
Now, under the VAT law, there was no threshold limit. Even if I have a turnover of 500 crores, right, I could opt for a composition scheme and pay tax at the rate of 4%, not take input credit. But under GST, if my turnover is 20 lakh, sorry, 50 lakh, 1 rupee, I am not able to composition scheme. Correct? In that case, they say, if you are under composition scheme, switching over to the regular scheme, whatever stock you have on which you are going to pay taxes under GST, you show me that you have a tax paying document, I will give credit of it. Because today you are not allowed to take credit, output was 4%. Under GST, the same output is 18%. By using this raw matrix, you are going to pay 18% tax. On this raw matrix, I am going to give you full credit. Are you able to follow? Yes. Definitely it is complex. Definitely it will take time for us to digest. You are uh, still not uh, cleared CA final. The people who have cleared CA final, including me, have to read it again and again and again to understand. <laughs> if you have not understood, you are normal. If you have understood, you are extraordinary genius. So, if you think what is this nonsense this guy is talking about, you are in the right track. <laughs> don't worry at all. But uh, don't put a full stop to your reading on GST and say, I thought I will start my career in GST after I finish a CA and after listening to me it say, what nonsense law this I have not understood. Don't carry that thought. This session or the entire day session should be an eye opener for you or it should give an introduction to GST to you and you have to read a lot of material available online and published by ICA to understand more about GST. Like I said, nobody is an expert in GST, so you don't have to think which book is good, which book is bad. You start writing your own book. <laughs> because nobody knows what is correct, what is wrong. Whatever you say based on a reasonable interpretation might be a correct view. Uh, next, can we go to the next topic? Yes, sir. to be a little more interactive and to at least pretend that you are understanding. And then it demotivates me. Right? <laughs> Sales returns. See, look at this scenario. You have to, you have to visualize. Lot of Just visualize this scenario. I have sold the goods on 30th June 2017. Right? And my customer within two days has rejected those goods. Right? Mintra. I have purchased something from Mintra. They say, I don't know what is your size. You say, even I don't know what is my size. I keep going to McDonald's and my size keeps varying. So, Mintra says, okay, no problem. I understand your problem. Because today I will give you L. Tomorrow I will come back and say, I don't want L. I want XL or double XL, whatever is the size. Depending on how many burgers we have had. So, let's say I will give you all the three sizes. You choose whatever you want. Right? And whatever you don't want, you give it back to me. Imagine this in GST. Not in GST. That in between period of 1000 and 2000. They have given all the three sizes. On 30th June, it has been dispatched from their warehouse, which is in Bombay. It comes to your house through Blue Dot Courier on 5th of July. You give it back. When it came, it was under VAT. When it is going, it is under GST. <laughs> Look at the problem. Now, change this to This we can relate to. Correct, no? Oh, everybody has done that to them. It's not my problem of size. Very good. Right? Now, imagine this scenario really happening between B2B transaction. What is B2B? Business to business transaction. I have manufactured certain goods. On 30th June, because GST is coming, I will not stop my business. GST is only 18% of my 118%. I am not going to bother about 18 to stop my 118. Correct, no? I dispatched the goods on 30th June 2017. The customer did not like the goods. On 5th of July, he said, I don't want your goods. When I send the goods under VAT, when I am getting back the goods under GST, and Problem could be, when I sent under VAT, no tax on those goods. When I got back, under GST there is tax. And under GST tax is not on sale, it is on supply. And supply could be with consideration 31A, without consideration 31C. What is he talking about? Under supply, there is section 3 which talks about meaning and scope of supply. 
I thought it has been done. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there, there is section 3. I don't remember sections. Right? I am like you only. As per Income Tax Act, and also as per 213, I will not say which judgment. As per Honorable Supreme Court, that's all. All got done. Right? So there in supply, there is three clauses 31A, 31B, 31C. 31A says supply includes all forms of supply for consideration by one person to another. That means for it to be taxed under GST, there has to be consideration. But 31C says supply will also include a transaction where there is no consideration. That is a transaction between two related parties or distinct person. I am sending goods to my branch in Tamil Nadu. Is there a consideration? No consideration. Still I have to pay tax because it is falling under 31C. Right? When I sent, there was consideration 31A tax applicable. When he sent back the goods to me, there is no consideration, but it is my related party. So in GST it will become a supply. When I sent tax is applicable, when I got back also tax is applicable. When I sent it was only 5.5%, when I got back 18%. How to handle these transactions? Because presently, I get 6 months time under the VAT law to get the goods back without the taxes. I will get deduction of whatever tax I have already paid. Sales return within 6 months time. What happens when GST gets implemented on 1st July 2017 for transactions already executed before 1st July 2017? I am sure you are going to love this. Very simple. If the sale has happened pre-GST, that is before 1st July 2017 and they say within 6 months from the appointed date that means that sale should have happened between 1st January 2017 and 1st July 2017 before that is not covered right and there was no tax applicable on this transaction whatever is the uh, goods which have been sent there is no tax on that transaction and the goods are returned within 6 months time from the date of implementation of GST, that is till 31st of December 2017, no problem at all. You don't have to pay tax, it will not be treated as a supply. I will repeat again if the transaction happened from 1st January 2017 to 30th June 2017 and the goods are returned by 31st December 2017, don't bother. Even if the returns have come, it may be treated as a supply, but you are not required to pay tax because the original transaction was not liable to tax. Clear? If the goods are returned to you after 6 months time, then check whether the person to whom you have sold the goods is registered or not registered. Clear? If he is registered, then when he sends the goods to me, he will have to pay the tax. Now look at this. Theoretically everything sounds good. Practically, I have sold the goods to him, zero tax. I am the seller. I have sold the goods to him, zero tax. Under GST, the goods are liable to tax. Right? He gives the goods to me on 15th of January 2018. After 6 months, he is the purchaser of the goods. He will send the goods to me, though he is a purchaser of goods, he will have to charge tax and give it to me. Look at the scenario now. I sold the goods to him, 100. He gave me the goods back, 100. 100 minus 100, 0. But along with 100, there will be another 18. So, first of all, I am angry with him that he has given the goods back to me. Upon that, I will have to pay him 18 rupees. Because he is going to supply the goods to me. You are to follow? I will repeat again. I gave you 100 rupees. After 6 months if you return to me, you give me 100 rupees, plus you will charge me 18 rupees which I have to pay. You have kept my 100 rupees. You should have paid interest. You will collect the interest from me, pay to the government and charge it from me. The thing is, I will be able to take credit of it. See, whether I pay, not pay, all those would be a dispute. But if he charges and if I accept it, I am sure Naveen would have saw, uh, spoken to you about matching concept briefly. He said he has not been able to cover it completely. So, we will discuss that. If he uploads it as a supply and I will accept it as a purchase, I will be able to take credit. But logically, see, first of all, I am angry with him 
that he has not given the goods to me. He is angry with me because I have sent him some wrong goods. And on that, government expects us to settle this 18 rupees also because they want to be peaceful. Correct? Right? Going to be very difficult. What if it is unregistered? Mintra, after six months, uh, you give the goods back. No problem. They say you don't have to be, you don't have to pay tax on it if it is not registered. So we will have to bifurcate our sales returns into B to B, B to C. B to C no impact. B to B, I will have to pay tax to him, collect the credit, show it in my GST return. Is this clear? This is simple. We look at uh, sales pre GST, which was liable to tax. I have sold the goods under the current regime, which was liable to tax. Correct? The goods have come to me within six months time. The sale could have been made to a registered person, not to a registered person. If it is made to a registered person, it will be treated that as if he has supplied the goods to me and he will have to pay the tax. I would have charged him 100 plus 5.5. He will charge me 100 plus 18. Same problem on the differential is going to come. Correct? If not registered, then whatever taxes you have paid, you can claim refund of that taxes. Is this clear? If the return comes after six months and you have sold the goods to registered or not registered, your condition will not change as far as registered is concerned. He will pay the tax, you will get the credit. But if it is not registered, whatever taxes you have paid, swaha. <laughs> you will not get refund of that. Okay? I will repeat again. It's actually a little simple. Right? I will repeat again. If the supply what you the sale what you have made or goods what you have manufactured is liable to tax pre-GST and you have dispatched it to your customer, it could be a registered customer, B2B transaction or a non-registered customer, B2C transaction, then we have to check whether you have got the goods within six months time or not. Or I'll simplify it. We have to check whether your customer is a registered customer or not a registered customer. If he is a registered customer, whenever he returns the goods, he will have to pay the tax of 18% and give the goods to me. Whether he returns within six months time or after six months time. But if he is not registered, bifurcate the sales returns into two. Within six months, after six months. If it is within six months, cash refund. If it is after six months, forget the tax. This is exactly similar to the current provisions under the VAT law. You will get deduction of the sales returns only if the returns are within six months time. <coughs> they are not giving a deduction because what you paid is VAT and what you are claiming deduction of is under GST. So say I will not give you a deduction but I will give you cash refund of whatever sales returns happens within six months time. Is this clear? Fairly simple. <coughs> Next, job work. What do you mean by job work? Anybody? I have been talking, talking, talking. Please stop. What is job work? What is job work? Perfect. Whatever I was supposed to do, I asked you to do. That is job work. I was supposed to tell what is job work because I am the speaker here. I am asking you to speak job work. I am a manufacturer and supposed to process something. I am asking somebody else to process that. That is called job work. My material, somebody else is working on it. That is job work. Now, I would have sent certain goods on job work basis to my uh, what do you say, vendor on 30th of June 2017. Why am I taking all the examples on 30th June 2017? Because that is what we are concerned about. If it is a transaction at the current uh, day, which is not completed also, we are not talking about those kind of transactions. I don't have to give a GST seminar on that. That will become VAT seminar and excise seminar. Right? So what we are talking about only these overlapping transactions which starts in the current regime and terminates in the GST regime. Right? So I sent certain goods on job work basis on 30th June. I have not supplied the goods. Sorry, I have not sold the goods. I have supplied the goods. But not liable to tax today. But under GST, 
when the job worker processes the goods and sends it back to me, he has supplied the goods. There may be no consideration, but it is a supply, and the GST tax is on supply, right? So there is a doubt whether job worker sending the goods back to the principal manufacturer will be liable to tax or not. It will not be, but as a concept, is it a supply? Yes, he has supply. Yeah, my own goods he has worked on it and he has given it back to me, right? Now in that case, what happens if the goods were sent on 30th of June and it came back to me after GST? So say, if dispatch is pre-GST, no tax. Because tax under the current law is only on sale. I have not sold any goods to my job worker. Right? If the job worker finishes the processing of the goods within 6 months time and gives it back to me, no problem. Because even the current law says, job worker can keep my goods for 6 months. After 6 months he has to return the goods to me. Within 6 months, not after 6 months. Right? If he returns the goods to me after 6 months time, then whatever credit I had claimed on that input which I sent to the job worker, I will have to reverse that credit. Is this clear? <coughs> Certain other procedural aspects which I have already given in the material, you can have a self-read of them. Right? <coughs> we will discuss interesting provisions only because I am sure with the clock ticking every minute, the interest also is reducing direct proportion. Right now? Revision in prices. I had agreed that I will sell certain goods at 100 rupees. But for some reason I wanted to give discount to my customer. Or for some reason the prices increased from 100 to 110. Both scenarios could happen. In that case what would be the implication of GST? When I supplied, I supplied at 100. But when I am finally billing him, I have to either add 10 rupees because the price has increased or I have to reduce 5 rupees because I want to give him a discount of 5 rupees. Right? Because there was a renegotiation in the price. If there is an upward revision, 100 on 30th June, 5th July 110. Right? If there is an upward revision, then the 10 rupees will be treated as if it, you have supplied the goods under GST. On 100 you will pay 5.5% or 14.5% tax. On the 10 rupees you have to pay 18 rupees tax. Uh, 18 rupees, sorry, 18% uh, times which is 1.8 rupees by raising a credit note. And the other person will be able to take the credit. So, under GST, theoretically, this transaction will be bifurcated into two. 100 rupees pre-GST, pre-GST tax. 10 rupees post-GST, post-GST tax will be applicable. Is this clear? But if the prices reduce, then you will have to reverse that. Whatever invoice you have raised, to that extent, whatever discount you want to give, you have to reverse it by issuing a credit note. In your books, it will be a credit note and ensure that the buyer reverses the credit. I'll give an example. I have sold goods worth 100 rupees. Then I realized actually the value of goods was not 100, it is 90 rupees. On 100, I had charged a tax of 14.5. My buyer would have taken a credit of 14.5 rupees. Now, I am saying, sorry, sorry, it is not 100 plus 14.5, it is 90 plus 14.5. So I will get deduction of 14.5 on 10 when I raise the credit note. I have to ensure that my buyer also reverse the credit because I am claiming a deduction. If not, it will become a planning tool. I will raise invoice worth of 100 rupees at 1 lakh rupee. He will get the credit. I have to pay the tax. In GST, I will reverse it and say no, no, it is not 1 lakh. 3 zeros extra because the article was working over time. He has put some 3 zeros extra in there. Actually, it was only 100 rupees transaction. Right? I have to ensure that whatever deduction I am claiming, the other person has reduced, reduced that credit or reversed that credit. Clear? Move ahead. If you do one thing, you will go to some interesting aspects in GST and then you will come back to this boring topic. Yes sir, it's boring. <laughs> Even nodding head. Totally understand, no problem at all. It will give some surprise elements so that you will understand better. Go to returns and returns. You know how returns are going to be filed under GST? Before that, how many of you have worked on indirect taxes in your office? Quite a few of them. How many of you are involved in generation of Form C? Indirect tax or not, but Form C many of you are generated. The most painful job, the good news is, there is no Form C under GST. I have not decided. 
You know why? Form C is for concessional rate. In GST there is no concessional rate. Everywhere you pay higher rate of tax. That means we will not have any job at all, sir. I was specializing in generating Form C. In the office, I had value because only I knew how to generate Form C. If address is wrong, how to file an affidavit, tell the department where to cancel that and get the uh, correct Form C. Only I knew in the office. That is why they have retained me in the office. You are saying no Form C means what job? Don't worry. We have another very good job for you. What is that job? Credit matching. On 10th of each month, right? On 10th of each month, whoever is a taxable person in GST in whole of India will be busy uploading their sales. Everybody will upload sales, they will not file the return. Everybody will upload their sales. That is called outward supply. So on 10th, I will file outward supply, my customer will file outward supply, my vendor will file outward supply. Everybody will file outward supply. But whenever I am filing the details of outward supply and if it is a B2B transaction, I will mention the GST number of my customer. Right? Somebody has sold goods to me, he will ask me my GST number and upload his sales. Because he is using my GST number, whatever he has uploaded as sales will become my purchase. By 10th he has to upload his sales, by 11th it will become my purchase. You are able to follow, I will repeat again. Before 10th, meaning by 10th, I have to upload. Everybody who is registered have to upload their outward supply mentioning the GST number of their customer. By 11th, the transaction will come on my dashboard as you have purchased the goods from Mr. C. We forgot the link from C, you know. From C, it has come to H. Right? So, Mr. C from Tamil Nadu sold the goods to me by giving my GST number. It will be his sale, it will become my purchase. Clear? You are able to follow? Now, uh, by 15th, I have got 5 days time. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15th. I can accept that transaction. He sold goods worth 1 lakh rupees to me. The goods have also come. The invoice has also come. I have also accounted that invoice. What he has uploaded online is absolutely correct. I will accept that credit. Whatever tax he has paid will be available to me as input tax credit. Clear? Next. He has uploaded 1 lakh but GST number instead of using his number, he has used my number. Typing error. Instead of using his GST number, he has put my GST number. Now I am looking at my purchase record. From that vendor I have not purchased anything at all. So, he has uploaded, I will delete it. Clear? Because it is not at all my purchase. Next, he has sold me goods worth 1 lakh. Invoice is also 1 lakh. Online statement 80,000. Manual error. Definitely there will be some typing error. Because of that, he has uploaded either 80,000 or 1 lakh 20,000. I can modify it. And say, boss, what you have is not 1 lakh 20 or 80, it is actually only 1 lakh rupees. He sent me 1 lakh worth of goods. He sent me invoice for 1 lakh from dashboard, no information. He has forgotten to upload sales made to me. I can insert it. All scenarios covered. I will repeat again. You go backwards. On 10th or by 10th, all the outward supplies have to be uploaded. The purchaser by 15th has to either accept it or delete it if it is not his purchase or he has to modify it if the data is not correct or insert if he has got the invoice but the credit is not appearing online. Correct? On 17th, that is his job now, the person who has uploaded the outward supply. On 17th, if he has uploaded, I have accepted what is his problem, my problem, no problem, he will not do anything. Right? He does not have to do anything. He has uploaded, I have deleted, inserted or modified. I want to trouble my vendor. Right? He has uploaded 1 lakh, correct only. Invoice also 1 lakh, goods also 1 lakh. I will modify it, say no, 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 what you have sold me is not 1 lakh, it is 1 crore. <laughs> he will have to pay tax on that. So I can always modify it and blackmail him saying, I am not going to change my data till you do not give me free service. <laughs> to pay the tax. Correct? 
So to avoid that kind of harassment, whenever there is a delete, modify, and insert, within two days time, the person who has uploaded the outward supply has to either accept it, reject it, or no action. If he accepts it, no problem. See, if given me invoice of 1 lakh, but uploaded 80,000, I have changed it to 1 lakh, he has accepted it, no problem. He has uploaded, he has given me invoice of 1 lakh, I have, and uploaded 80,000, I have changed it to 1 lakh, right? He will have, he has not accepted it. His tax will be only on 80,000, because he has accepted his liability of only 80,000. I will also credit, get credit only on 80,000. When the audit comes there, so I have reported 1 lakh, a notice will be issued to both of us. Both of us will have to justify. Whoever is correct, that the claim will be well, will be qualified and I have so purchased goods at 1 lakh, I will get credit of 1 lakh. On the 20,000, he will have to pay the differential tax along with interest. You are able to follow and repeat again. 10th outward supply, 15 they accept the outward supply as purchase. And in 17, whatever modifications have been made on 15 have to be either approved or rejected. Clear? Today, under VAT laws, we file three statements. Sales, purchase and VAT 100. What is the due date for that? 20th of the next month. They say under GST, we should obviously change. We cannot have same dates. Under exercise you file on 10th. TDS you file on 15th. Regular return you file on 20th. We will make everybody happy. So you will have to file three returns on 10th, 15th and 20th. On 10th, outward supply. On 15th, you have to accept all the transaction, reject, modify or delete. By 20th, 10th minus 15th, outward minus inward, what is the balance amount, you have to pay the tax by 20th of the next month. So 10th you will upload sales, 15th you will accept the purchases, 20th you don't have to file the return. 10th whatever is your sale on that output tax, minus on 15th whatever is the purchase tax, 10th minus 15th or 20th you will pay that tax in cash. Apart from that there are other registrations and on, for those registrations there are different returns. Last one is for, of interest to all of us, GSTR 8 is an annual return, it is like form 240 where you have to do audit of the client, match the numbers with the financial statements, if there is discrepancy, give reasons, and then sign and say whatever is given is correct or not. Is this clear? Now imagine, coffee day example which we are talking about, 29 states where they have got operations, today for the entire year, they file only 2 returns. Under GST, how many returns? 3 returns per month, per location multiplied by 12 so 3 returns multiplied by 12 per unit multiplied by 29 states plus 1 return per state as annual return so all those friends of mine who are concerned what will you do after form C we have GSTR 1, 2, 3 and 8 correct and trust me if you say the chartered account has got lot of opportunity because of this matching concept, I would feel it is better to open a call center from 10 to 7 days. <laughs> On 10th, if your sales have not been uploaded, call all your vendors and say why have you not uploaded? <laughs> call all your customers and say why have you not matched? And reverse charge mechanism is applicable in GST, reverse calls also you will get. It is in our interest to ensure that we are dealing with good vendors because if they do not pay the tax, I will not be able to take credit of it. Because this credit whatever I get is only a provisional credit. He uploaded, I accepted 17 everything fine, but that's only a provisional credit. If he does not pay the tax on 20th, I will not get that credit. Right? So like in Flipkart, when we purchase the goods, we have product rating, we have vendor rating also. How is the vendor? Has he delivered the goods on time? Does he process the refunds on time? All those. So we will only buy from vendors who has a rating more than 4 out of 5. In GST also we will have a GST compliance rating. Everyone will be first train student on 1st July 2017. Everybody's rating will be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Then as soon as you start defaulting, not filing the returns, not responding to notices, not paying the taxes correctly, not paying the interest correctly, the 10 will become 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 and 
after three, after limit they say you will be blacklisted. So in our internal controls, how to choose a vendor? One additional point will be, have you checked the GST rating of the vendor? On the day when you get a quote from the vendor, ask his GST number, put that in the GST uh, portal, take the printout of like we do for foreign exchange, from Honda.com we will get the exchange rate, take a print of it and put it in our audit paper file. Like that, take a print of it from the GST portal and put it in the vendor uh, selection process and keep it there so that if anybody comes and check what was the GST registry, uh, rating because it's only 3. No sir, when we did the audit uh, or review it was 7. That is why we have done that Right? Is this clear? At least this process is okay. We will go to registration now. Who are required to get registered under GST? Any person having a turnover more than 20 lakh rupees has to get registered under GST. As simple as it. But if you are in northeast states, then your turnover limit is only 10 lakh rupees. Clear? If you have got different locations in India, it is not per location 20 lakh rupees. In aggregate across India, your turnover if it is more than 20 lakh rupees, you have to get registered under GST. Next. If you are registered under the existing law, even then you have to get registered under GST. Clear? So if you are registered under the current law, you have to get registered under GST. You will get a provisional registration. If you want to cancel, you can apply online and cancel that registration. But by default, you will get a provisional registration. If you are selling the goods outside the state, from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu, threshold limit is not applicable. Your turnover is 10 lakh. One sale of 500 rupees you made to a customer in Tamil Nadu. Over. You have to take a registration. That 20 lakhs is applicable only for local sale, not applicable for interstate sale. If you are a person required to pay service tax under reverse charge, GST under reverse charge mechanism. I said we have a lot of baggage. We still talk about service tax only not GST. Right? If you are a person required to pay GST under reverse charge mechanism, say you have imported certain services, your turnover is 10 lakh rupees as a chartered accountant, right? You have purchased a Google Drive on import of service, you have to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism. You cannot be exempt from GST, you will have to take registration because you are liable to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism. If you are under composition scheme, that means you have a turnover from 20 lakhs to 50 lakhs, even then you have to take a registration. Apart from that, even if your turnover is 5 lakh rupees, voluntarily if you want to take registration, you can take a registration, even though your threshold limit is not more than 20 lakhs. Apart from that, who else is supposed to take registration? Assuming I am a dweller in Bangalore and if I want to participate in an exhibition which is happening in Bombay, it is an exhibition come sale. I will display the jewellery what I have and if some customer is interested, I am also going to sell that jewellery. In that case, I am going to execute a local sale in Maharashtra because I am also in Maharashtra and my customers are also in Maharashtra. I will charge CGST and Maharashtra GST but nobody has a control over me because I will come, I will go. The assessment will happen only after one year or two years. In that case, they say you get registered as a casual taxable person in Maharashtra, all these uh, cracker shops, they will be from Mosur, they will come here, set up a stall, they will sell the cracker. All of them, whoever does not have a permanent place of business in a state where, where they are doing business, will have to get registered as a casual taxable person, pay taxes on the anticipated turnover in advance and then report their final liability. If there is a difference, they have to pay the tax. And that registration will have a validity of only 3 months, which can be extended by another 3 months. That is called a casual taxable person. I do not have a place of business in that state, casual taxable person. I do not have a place of business in India, non-resident taxable person. Like from Karnataka, I can go into an exhibition in Bombay. Somebody from Belgium can also come to Bombay for the same exhibition. He will have to take registration as a non-taxable person, non-resident non taxable person. The provision is applicable to casual dealer exactly the same way it will apply to a non-taxable, non-resident taxable person also. Clear? Next. They have come up with a concept called business vertical. In one state I will get only one registration, 
But assuming I have got lot of business verticals, I am into construction and I also have hotels. Two separate businesses. If I have two separate businesses, at my option, I can take two separate registration. One for my construction business and one for my hotel business. That will have its own advantages and disadvantages. Advantages because I want to do accounting on a cost, a cost center basis or a profit center basis. I know what is the turnover of construction, I know what is the turnover of hotel separately, I want to file separate returns. But issue is, if I stock transfer goods from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu, different persons, I am required to pay tax. If I stock transfer goods from my hotel business to my construction business, that will also be treated as distinct person, I will have to pay tax on that. And it is not all India, one business, one tax. Each state I will have to take to two returns, sorry, registration. So two returns, two assessments, all those procedures we will have to follow. Then if I enter into works contract, there is a provision which the government can ask for TDS. It is called back TDS currently. GST TDS can also be applied. So whenever I am making the payment, I will have to retain not only the income tax TDS, but also GST TDS and pay the balance amount to the uh, vendor. That In that case, because I am retaining the amount, I am required to get registered. Apart from that, if I am selling the goods on an e-commerce operate, operator, with an e-commerce operator, that means like Flipkart, it's a marketplace, somebody who is in Avenue Road will upload his goods and I am sitting in MG Road, I will purchase those goods by using the platform. Flipkart will get the money from my credit card they will transfer it to the vendor who is in Avenue Road. When they are paying 100 rupees, they will have to retain 1%, 1% to 2% they will have to retain and transfer to him 98 rupees and on his behalf, deposit 2% to the central government and the state government. Whenever he files the return, he will, he will get 100 rupees you have made a sale. On that you are required to pay a tax of 18 rupees. 2 rupees is already been paid by fifth card. Balance 16 rupees you have to pay the tax. That is called TCS. Sir, is it get reflected in returns, sir? Yes. If you see this GSTR-7, whenever you file the GSTR-7, Flipkart will file GSTR-7, by 15 it will get reflected in my GSTR-2. Okay. Right? <coughs> okay. Next. I, I heard a lot of people asking questions on input service distributor when Naveen was here. So I hope that you are already aware of the concept of input service distributor. Right? If I want to pass on the credit as an input service distributor, then also I have to get registered as an input service distributor. These are the people who will have to get registered under GST. One, if my turnover is more than 20 lakhs. Second, interstate supplies. Third, if voluntary registration. Fourth, reverse charge mechanism, fifth, conversion dealers, next year casual dealers or non-resident taxable persons, you have the, then you have business verticals, TDS and TCS, input service distributors. Any questions we have? Not going to tell you what the last speaker said, when there were no questions. About five more minutes, so we will finish up the slides which we are discussing about. We finished in price revision. Refunds I will skip. We don't have time. Yes, please. Yes, please. Does registration mean I have to collect and pay GST? Like, once long back I was registered. And this year I have only one sale. Which year? This year, suppose 10 lakhs, and next year, this year, I mean, previous year was 10 lakhs. Before the GST got implemented, it was 10 lakhs. No. Then? Suppose 2000 future. Future. Okay. Uh, yeah, the turnover is 10 lakhs. First year it was more than 20 lakhs, so I got registered. Okay, first year means, sir, I am sorry, I am asking you a lot of questions. 2017 18 your turnover was 10 lakhs or uh, 25 lakhs. Yeah, 25 lakhs. So okay. I got registered. You got registered, you paid the tax also and you yeah. filed the returns. Excellent. Sorry? 2018 19 nothing. Excellent question, actually. If you look at the service tax law today, it says, guys, if you maintain silence, if you look at the service tax law today, the exemption says 
you will get an exemption of 10 lakh rupees. Correct? Provided in the current year, provided your last year turnover is less than 10 lakh rupees. So if I start with a business today, last year my turnover is zero, so current year I will get an exemption of 10 lakh rupees. Current year I made a, I rendered services of 25 lakh rupees, next year I will not get the exemption because last year my turnover was more than 10 lakhs. The next year after 25 lakhs, my turnover was 5 lakh only. I will have to pay tax on the entire 5 lakhs, but the year after that, I am not required to pay tax on the first 10 lakh rupees because my last year turnover was only 5 lakh rupees. Every year I could see whether my last year turnover is less than 10 lakh rupees or not. Correct? Under GST what happens? Under GST they have given a threshold limit only for registration. They said if your turnover is less than 20 lakhs, you are not required to get registered under GST. If your turnover is more than 20 lakhs, you are required to get registered under GST. The exemptions have not come. So in fact, even if your turnover is less than 20 lakhs, as of now, it is only 1 lakh, but you have gone under voluntary registration, you, you will have to pay tax. Because those exemptions have not come. I am sure it is going to come. But as of now, we do not have the copies of those exemption notifications or rules. Once it comes, maybe we will get clarity on this. Anything else? It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session on transition, provisions and procedure for registration and returns. I now request CA Ravindra S. Kode, Chairman of Sikasa Bangor, to present a token of appreciation to our speaker, CA Harnishas. Thank you. Thank you.